get started because we have quorum and Kari is going to join us in four minutes. So the first order of business today, first is 504. Welcome to this beautiful day. And unfortunately, you're going to be inside with us for a little bit, but hopefully we'll keep it productive. Uh, we're going to have an executive session today. We got a, I, I got a question from, from Lindy online, so I, I checked in. So we, if somebody could make us a motion to go in an executive session for negotiations and for the purpose of discussing the appointment or employment or evaluation of a public employee, please. Could somebody I will make, I'll, I'll make that motion that we go into executive session for the purposes of negotiation and uh, that text that Floor wrote that hopefully we can get to Lisa. Can I, can I just interrupt for one second? Yep. Uh, so uh, if uh, we're talking about the employment of a public uh, official, that's not what was warned on this. And if it's talking about my employment, I would uh, prefer to have legal it's counsel. evaluation, Brian. So it says okay. It, okay. The, the way that the, that the law reads. So I check uh, in, so it's VSA section 313, if you wanna check that. Okay. A number three, and it's uh, and it's just the whole sentence is appointment, employment, or evaluation. So it's that's what I that's what I read, and that was from council. So I didn't make that up. <laughs> so okay. So could I have a second for that? So Jonas moves it, and Floor, could you cut and paste that verbiage into chat for me so I can make sure I get it? Yeah, Thank you. I will. I will do that in one second. I, I think okay. I have to email it to you because the chat goes Actually, to Jim. Well, the, yeah, the chat will come to me. I, I can I can take that in, in, in verbatim, bring it over to Lisa. That's no problem. Okay, and I believe Stephen is seconding the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So the motion carries, let's move into executive session and I'll send you this language, listen. I think we have to say who's going in. I, I have the list here so far. Um, is there anybody besides the board members that are going in and Brian? Brian. Um, I'd, I, yeah, I'd like to have Carla and you know, Lori, if you're here, there's you know, no reason not to have you in to talk about the negotiation stuff. Sorry, we're a few minutes late. We'll get started with our meeting. It's 1809. So I would like to welcome our guests. I see we have about 93 people, including the board. So it's about 84 people. So, wow, this is pretty exciting. Thank you for joining us. We have 15 minutes exactly for, for public comments. And I'm gonna ask Jim to, to keep track of the time for, for me, if that's possible. And if you could uh, raise your hand, we are gonna start with public comments today and that's a change in our agenda. And I see Chris Winter, so I'll let him go first. Welcome, Chris, please Hello. go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, folks. Thanks for um, giving me some time. Uh, I've sent everybody an email, so <clears throat> I can be fairly brief. Um, this is regarding the proposed cuts to the uh, Berlin Arts and Music. And I just wanna, wanted to say that we're all learning now how our newly consolidated district is, is going to work. And I think it's to be expected that there'll be some growing pains <clears throat> and maybe some mistakes along the way. Um, getting all the schools and communities of a, of a formerly separate boards um, growing in the same direction I know requires a lot of hard work and a new way of doing things. And it's different than what my experience was as a board member when I was on the Berlin board, when it still existed. So I appreciate the efforts you're making and how much work it takes. Um, but one area that was always a concern when we were talking about consolidation, as many of you on this board still will recall, was the loss of local feedback and decision-making. Um, and I think the necessary delegation of more decision-making to the central office, that's bound to happen under a, a consolidated board and district. So again, I know it's hard work to keep those lines of communication open and the decisions transparent, but it's work that we have to do if we're gonna maintain trust in our communities and trust among the staff members across the district. So I'm asking that you please um, reconsider the decision to cut hours from the Berlin Music and Arts Program 
uh, taking away those hours now without more community awareness and more input would be a mistake and would send the wrong message about how this board and this district plans to operate in the future, especially as we come off a highly unusual year where we've already lost valuable art and music learning time with our kids. Uh, now's not the time. So, and at the risk of using yet another bad metaphor, in addition to the one I sent you by email, um, if one school has a slightly bigger or than the others, <clears throat> perhaps the others need bigger ors too to balance things out. And it seems to me that the immediate reaction should, should be to analyze the needs of all the rowers rather than downsize the one outlier. And, and I also don't think we should use a formula to hand out oars, you know, oars that are one fifth the size or two fifths or three fifths the size of a full oar. Um, so bad metaphor over. I, I really hope we have a district-wide conversation about equity and the value of music and arts programming programming that, as we all know, is, is so much more than just art and music and goes well beyond those classes to integrate with all the other learning and enrichment within the full educational environment. This might seem like a small scheduling decision right now, but it will have a long-term impact on our kids, on our communities, on our schools, and the very important relationships that, that make us a unified district. So I thank you for the time tonight whether you call this scheduling equity or cuts, whatever you call it, please reject any proposal that reduces hours at any school without full transparency and buy-in from the communities. Otherwise, I think you'll be using exactly the same process that we were afraid of as we were moving toward consolidation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Lisa, Hannah? Thank you. Um, I've written out some of my thoughts to say concise, so I apologize if it sounds like I'm reading. Um, so as always, thank you to the board for all of your work. Um, in my following of board activities this year, I've been especially tuned in to the ongoing conversation that you've been having about the need to elicit more stakeholder voice and to find more opportunities to hear from the public. I agree with you that this is the foundation of local governance. The discourse between you, our elected officials, and the stakeholder groups is critical for our success as a community. And while the structure of our school board has changed and now has a wider berth, I hope that this discourse remains at the heart of um, our belief in what local governance is. With that vision of increased participation from our community in mind, I hope that you consider the recent vote taken by teachers and staff and subsequent data that was shared with you as participation from your board. Our collective reaching out to you, um, our local officials with critical information to share. I hope that you see it as an opportunity to value the voices of teachers and staff and to ask questions, engage in dialogue and to truly hear the concerns of a significant group. And more broadly, I hope that you see this as an opportunity to frame how the whole board can respond to and honor the voices of any group of stakeholders, whether it be teachers and staff or parents or community members or students from any of our unified district communities. Um, I ask that you embrace this as a critical moment when our voices can be valued or our voices can be dismissed and I hope that together we can choose the former. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Allison? So Allison Levin, I um, wanted to speak on behalf of my husband, Matt, and two sons who currently are attending Berlin Elementary. Um, I'm asking tonight that you reject the re recommendations you have received from the administration regarding the arts and music staffing. Uh, cuts uh, that many of us have just recently become aware of. I believe you should reject the recommendations for many reasons, but I will, but I know time is limited, so I'll just mention one um, tonight. Um, it is not clear to me how you as a board members can make a fully informed decision on this issue, important issue, um, when you have not been presented with any alternatives. Um, they have been, um, they have not provided you with information about what choices you may be able to choose from and any or any plan B. The memo in your board packet does not tell you anything about the financial impacts of the cuts or what it would cost to reverse these cuts that would impact the lives of many, many children in the coming years and in the coming year and for many years to come. I urge you to reject these cuts um, and reject the recommendation of the memo. Um, you have the money, you have the opportunity, you have the choice for plan B, even if the administration has not provided you with one. Please um, restore these positions for one year so we can have a real discussion about how to achieve a positive equity in all of our schools in our newly merged district. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alison. Kate and Drew, you're on deck, and then Claire. Uh, good evening. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm Kate McCann, a math teacher at U32, who's proud to be the co-president of the recently consolidated Washington Central Educators Union. I'm here tonight to vigorously oppose the decision to cut allied arts programming. As educators, we know the value of the arts to our students, especially at a time when they are needed most. And we stand with parents in opposing these cuts. Sadly, this is yet another example of why we have lost confidence in the superintendent's ability to lead our district. Indeed, Brian Olkowski's lack of transparency with us and parents, his poor communication skills, and his failure to work collaboratively with our school community leads to decisions like this one. It has been a tough year to be a leader in any organization. That said, when things are hardest is when we need the strongest leadership. Unfortunately, that is not what we have seen this year. Mr. Olkowski has failed on a number of fronts, failed the faculty, failed the board, failed parents, and sadly failed the district's students. And let me be clear, these failures are not because of the unprecedented year we've been through. Brian Olkowski has single-handedly worked to undermine the collaborative and equity-based culture that our district has spent years developing. His record this year reveals someone not interested in listening to others, but who is instead intent on disempowering administrators, teachers, parents, and students by pushing his agenda as the only way forward without any process for a student-centered approach. As a result, our district has lost several top-notch administrators, teachers, and staff this year. I don't have to tell you that this, this translates to huge losses for our school communities at a time stability is so critical. It is glaringly clear to us that the superintendent's approach leads to decisions that are bad for our students. The allied arts cuts is one such bad decision. Each one of you represents all 10,000 people in the five towns of our district. We know that you are dedicated to our communities and to our schools. Today, you can overturn a decision that is harmful to our students. Please do not go along with these dangerous cuts. Show the parents and students of this district that you stand with them. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Hello, I'm Drew Junkins. I'm a co-department head at U32 for math. And I just wanted to speak towards the leadership of the district at Central Office. I believe that this community we have in Washington Central uh, Supervisory Union, I believe it's on openness, communication, and willing to collaborate. I haven't seen that in multiple circumstances, starting from the beginning of the year when one of my teachers in my department had to decide between having a job or protecting her family. And that decision was almost made without talking to people. And that makes me fearful. And then another case is with the curriculum review. The curriculum review is not a good reflection of our learning environment that we could provide. We were trying to do our best with the pandemic. And I feel like making changes based off of that year was not thought through. And the last thing I want to think of is making these proposed changes without communicating to you, the board, the community, or the teachers. I looked in the notes and I saw uh, the notes from the board meeting April 27th, and I saw that there wasn't clear communication that this was going to be the case and that cuts weren't even being talked about. And I think that's sort of fearful for me. So I feel like in order to have as a uh, a better leadership experience, I feel like there needs to be way better communication. I know I am one of many teachers that have felt alienated by what's going on, and I'm fearful of what might happen. Thank you, Drew. Uh, Claire and, and Cara, and I think that would make time. Hi, my name is Claire Gallagher, and I am a fourth grade teacher at East Montpelier Elementary School. Um, and I am speaking to um, a week ago, I was given documents that uh, stated the number of literacy and math hours, and this was a district document. And so it was higher than, than years previous and including um, other district juries about increased mental health support and um, services in the classroom. So 
like many professions, you know, there's only so much uh, time during the day and it feels like there is the added pressure of more literacy and more math. Um, and I, I don't value that as an educator. I value a well-rounded student. I use Gardner's multiple intelligence as the means to guide my instruction and the way that I interact with students. So the question is, what, what do we need more of? And we need more collaboration with our allied arts teachers and more opportunities for integration. Um, and that doesn't say that literacy and math is less than the arts or the arts are, you know, that there needs to be a um, discussion about which is better or which is worse, but we value having a well-rounded education. And that's what I love about this district. And the cuts concern me as a means to diminish those opportunities to connect with educators that have expertise in the arts that are different than my expertise in liter literacy and math. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Cara? Um, thank you to the board for um, having public comment be first. We all appreciate that. Um, I'm not gonna speak to the cuts. I think many people have done it eloquently and I'm, I'm I'm mortally certain that you guys are having really good conversations um, behind closed uh, in your executive session. Um, what I am going to speak to is the issue that I've heard and read about as this issue being somehow framed as teachers are against consolidation. And one of the things that I think is really important to be stated really clearly is that this is not about consolidation. Um, certainly what we've heard is that this was a concern that was raised when consolidation happened. But this is not about teachers being against consolidation. We all understand that tough decisions have to be made. But what we want is a transparent system. We want leadership that uses transparency. This is, I am, and I didn't introduce myself properly. Um, I teach at U32 at the high school. I'm also on the negotiating team. One of the things that on the negotiating team between the teachers and the board, we all value is our transparent process of interest-based bargaining. And that's something that we have intentionally, the board and the teachers have embarked upon. And one of the core principles of that, that um, the mediators who train us each year emphasize is transparency. And we all agree, we all have to agree to engage in a transparent process. That's not just about that. And that's not just about negotiations. That works in a classroom, it works between adults and it works in a school system. Um, and one of the reasons is because transparency, and I talked a long time with the uh, federal mediator about this uh, back in December when we were, you know, we were just had some questions about how things might work in interest-based bargaining. And things, the thing that she said is that trust is paramount and that the only way that you develop trust is by being transparent again and again and again and again. And that is also true in a school system. The only way that you engender trust is to be transparent again and again and again and again and to show that you're acting with common decency and with concern for community. And those are the things that will make people want to go to the wall for you. And frankly, teachers who are always gonna be working at night, in the morning, whenever they schedule their work outside of school, they will be working outside of school. And you need them to be. You have to have teachers who are willing to go home and do their work. Um, and the way that you get them to do that is by treating them with common decency, with concern, by treating students with concern and the community with concern. And that's how you get people behind you. And these are the things that I am really concerned about as I see this conversation. However, this particular conversation um, shakes off in the end. These are the things that concern me uh, in the larger picture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kara. So I believe that concludes our public comments for today. I don't see any other raised hands. So we're gonna move into reports and discussion, but we really appreciate you coming today to give us your input. Thank you. So uh, are students here? Uh, yes, I, Anna? I, Anna might not be here. She, she, she was gonna be a little bit late. Um, but uh, so yeah, welcome. she Yes, if she if she pops in, then uh, I will so then she can join me. But for right now, it's probably looks like I'm going to be doing this by myself. Um, awesome. So uh, to start off, uh, last week there was um, or uh, last week and maybe the week before that. Yep, there were uh, SBAC testing for. Um, 
for lots of, of grades at U32, um, which I'm sure every student enjoyed greatly. And there's also, we're right in the middle of AP tests happening, um, which uh, our, our students are also enjoying greatly. So that's been, that's been a, um, a, a great test combination. Uh, the school year is almost over. There are actually uh, only a few more in-person weeks for the high school before the uh, end of the school year. And so things are, people are preparing for the end of the year. Um, they're finalizing plans for graduation. Um, and there's even going to be a, a senior prom. Um, in some middle school news, the middle school fire corps created an, uh, an interactive and visual educational museum about the civil rights movement. Um, talking about U32, which, which is a very, uh, you know, engaging, creative project um, in the middle school. And seventh graders are building solar cars and salad utensils um, as kind of a part of a hands-on learning and uh, diving into that. The, the final thing, I guess, is that the uh, U32 Chronicle has been, uh, you know, posting articles and documenting this year and many, some of the many interesting uh, things at our school and in our community. And so if, if you, anyone here wants to read about, read some, some great student journalism, check out the U32 Chronicle. Yes, and I, I think that's it for the student report. Any questions? Thank you, Towns. I'll open it up to board members. Do you have any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Towns, for being here. Mm -hmm. And okay, let's move into the co uh, superintendent's report. So COVID update, uh, Brian? Uh, yes, I'm gonna turn this over to Elizabeth Worth, our uh, COVID-19 coordinator, who has done just an outstanding job this year. And uh, as we, we're still so happy to have her uh, continue to do an outstanding job. And she has some important updates uh, regarding COVID-19 and vaccination clinics. So uh, Elizabeth, are you there? I'm here, yep. I'm right, here. great. Um, yeah, so, you know, there's always something new. That's, that's been what the year has brought. Um, but right, right now we're really working on, um, uh, getting ready to do a, a vaccine clinic at the high school next week, um, which was a great opportunity. I thought to, you know, get some of the students, the younger students who just were approved to get the vaccine. Um, in a simple way, you know, right at school, they can have a vaccine if they want to. Um, and so far, there's about, so far, as of yesterday, there's about 80 people who've signed up, all students, two, two adults, one mother and a grandfather, but that's all. So we'll all be U32 people. There could be walk-ins, but um, I'm really encouraged by just being able to offer that. And there's so many clinics available in the area that people, you know, signed up immediately um, as soon as it was opened up and they got a vaccine that day or the next day. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, by the beginning of next year, the, the high school and middle school will be in a much different place in terms of um, safety. And, uh, and then we still work with the elementary school. So I'm working on figuring out what the summer is going to bring, you know, what we're doing with sports and those kinds of things and summer school. And, and then, um, working with Maria, who's going to be taking over my position to uh, get ready for next year. And uh, yeah, so it's been a, it's been a, it's been an interesting year. And um, I, as I said, hopefully the, the clinic will run smoothly. There were some concerns about it that have been expressed, but I think that it, it's completely safe as far as I'm concerned. We've really done everything to, there won't be any communication with other people. Um, in the course of the clinic, it will all be students and anybody who comes into the clinic will be separate from students. So uh, I think that's, that's all no cases, none since the vacation. 
you know, another district I talked to had seven cases in one week and we haven't had any. So that's really gratifying and, and helpful and encouraging. So any questions? That's all I have to say. Chris. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, we're going to miss you next year. Uh, we'll be happy to have Maria, but we're going to miss you because you've been that calm, Fauci uh, presence throughout this <laughs> pandemic year, which is very nice to hear. Um, in terms of the, um, the vaccination for students under 18, is mm -hmm. parental consent required? Oh, yes. Okay. Just Absolutely. Yeah. Either, either parents have to come with a student or they need to have consent. Um, and it's all, it's done virtually, but the kids have to actually bring the signed consent In form the, to okay. the school. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Brian? Yeah, and I just want to thank Elizabeth as well. Uh, we will miss you next year. And I uh, think a, a lot of this uh, work that we've done this year, I can't imagine doing it without you, Elizabeth. And I also can't imagine doing it without the teachers and staff who worked extremely hard uh, in our district this year to be one of uh, five districts in the state to start on, uh, start for full-time in-person in learning. So my hat is off to all the teachers and staff and leadership team members. Uh, so uh, thank you, Elizabeth. So I'm going to uh, move on to the, uh, I think, the uh, a big topic that a lot of folks have spoken to previously to, tonight, and uh, that is about the art, music, allied arts. So uh, before proceeding with the recommendation from the leadership team, which is in your packet, I would like to comment about the process and my role in it concerning these reductions in the allied arts program. Uh, whenever considering a reduction in force or a transfer of staff, I believe a superintendent, this is me or any superintendent, at a minimum must consider the following questions. And these are, there are four of them that I, that I think about at a minimum. When is it appropriate to notify the school board about impending rifts and or transfers? Number two, when is it appropriate to notify staff about impending rifts and or transfers? Number three, when is it appropriate to notify Washington Central Educators Union about impending rifts and or transfers? When is it appropriate to notify parents and families about impending rifts and or transfers? In this case, uh, my decisions about when and how to discuss changes focus primarily on the rifts the pro process outlined in the collective bargaining agreement and the timeline for informing staff of these rifts by April 1st. I think it's very important to understand several other factors that influence the decision and my decision making around this process. The greater context of our, of our budget season, my concern about the impact of the pandemic on the economy, my desire to not have any of our staff members lose their jobs, especially during a pandemic, and my concern over educational programming that would be or could be lost if a budget did not pass. There was a very real concern, we all think back to the budget season, given the initial tax rate from the state and our pupil, per pupil spending that our budget may not pass. Here's additional context I saw during this time. COVID-19, shuttered our, our schools across Vermont, and we've been working currently, and we still are, in a state of emergency. Washington Central is a newly merged district, and we're one of five districts uh, in Vermont providing in-person learning five days a week from K through eight during this pandemic. And that's a tribute to our staff and our teachers, this Board of Education, our communities as well. In other districts I've worked, the public, and the association are normally invited to attend budget hearings and forums to ask questions. I honestly thought this was the opportune time for parents, families, staff, and others to be informed. The budget was presented several, presented several times in school board meetings and during community budget forums. I thought this provided multiple opportunities for folks to ask questions and give feedback and be informed. Second, and I said this before, I was really concerned about the budget not passing. That was a big priority this year to make sure we passed the budget in this horrible pandemic. If the budget did not pass, I was concerned 
that, and this has happened in other districts where the budget is not passed in Vermont, we would have to cut positions rather than transfer in our district. And that would impact students in the classroom and the lives of staff and educators whose jobs may be eliminated. The district's fiscally responsible budget was passed uh, successfully in early March. And this was a great outcome after my initial worry. I have done a lot of reflecting um, over these past several weeks. Through normal attrition and retirements, our district was able to achieve a budget that supports all our students. No one lost their jobs despite facing a pandemic and a declining student enrollment. In order to determine what was the best time this school year to notify folks, in the absence of not having any written procedures or policies regarding notification of transfers outside of the uh, collective bargaining agreement, I decided to follow the timeline outlined in the collective bargaining agreement for RIFs, which states that teachers are notified no later than April 1st. This meant that the school board needed to take some action sometime after the budget vote, but before April 1st. In hindsight, after having gone through this reflection, this is not nearly enough time for effective and thoughtful communication. But again, I want to make, make sure that I've outlined, I've outlined the extenuating circumstances this year. The, I, I will also disclose that the Teachers Association, some bo school board members, and leadership team members have informed me that the previous, in previous years, reductions impacting staff and programs had been shared much earlier than April 1st. So I understand things were done differently in the past. As a superintendent in a new district going forward, I will continue to learn and adapt to the expectations related to informing stakeholders about leadership team decisions. It is my hope that all stakeholders will work with me and the leadership team on this. Now, I also uh, just want to find, find and uh, just say that the uh, leadership team has been working on this recommendation for several years, uh, and uh, there is a history and rationale for it in the uh, packet, and now I will turn it over to the leadership team uh, to speak about the recommendation tonight. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm Aaron Boynton, the school principal at Berlin, and I'm going to start this evening on behalf of the elementary principals here tonight. I wanted to acknowledge the response that's in the board packet um, regarding that further comment on the recommendations. Um, but I wanna say heart to heart, uh, we hear you on transparency, 1000%. We hear you on fostering well-rounded children that have an opportunity for positive experiences. We clearly hear you on that. We are on the same page with that. Many of you know us, you know your elementary principals well, you work with us side by side every day in the trenches every day. You know us well enough that we don't want to make cuts. We do not want to reduce experiences for kids. We wish we had more time to do more and more time to do what is expected of public schools these days. We are dedicated to our schools that we work in and in navigating this newly consolidated district. I wanted to speak first because I know Berlin's been in, in, in the hot seat with uh, all of this around, around um, music and, and cuts. Please hear me clearly when I say there are no cuts to student contact time for art. Physical education, library, guidance, art. There is no change to student contact time for art, art keeps coming up, art and music. Nothing is going to change for the student time with art. <clears throat> for instrumental music, after looking further at opportunities that Berlin will have for students, historically, students have received two band and a chorus session per week and an instrumental music lesson per week. Looking at the schedule going into next year, we will be able to re retain this, this offering for students. Groupings might look different, but student contact time will be the same. Our students will have one lesson, two band sessions, 
and a course per week, which is not a change from the previous year. So I don't mind publicly saying that um, I, I personally apologize for moments of miscommunication, misunderstanding, and all of the other factors that have been brought up to administrators. Um, personally, I want what's best for all kids, what's best for kids at Berlin, what's best for teachers that support our kids. And to be able to look at next year and realize that we will be able to make it work where students have the same opportunity for music, instrumental music, um, I'm, I'm happy about that. But again, no other cuts to the arts are an even general music class uh, are being made. Thank you. I want to just echo some of what Aaron just shared. I'm Kat Fair. I'm the principal at Callis Elementary. And um, we are not making cuts in art or music at Callis. We are not changing the programming for students at all. We do have declining enrollment. We are down to five classrooms for next year. Um, one thing that I like to always keep in mind about Callis, we are small, but we are mighty and we care about the arts. And um, at Callis, I can guarantee you, I have already looked at and drafted a schedule that ensures that every classroom has the same access as they have always had to art education and the same access they have always had for music and enrichment, including instrument, band, and strings. What I don't have an answer for is Callis's music pro program has been up and down over the last few years. We're ready if there's a teacher who's passionate about strings. We are ready if there's a teacher who is passionate about band. We're ready if teachers are passionate about percussion. We just need a teacher. Um, but we are not talking about making any cuts at Callis. Thank you. I'm happy to share next. Um, I'm Casey Provost. I'm the principal at Romney and Middlesex. Um, we, as you, as you likely know, we're looking at a, a 0.1 reduction, which is a half day. Um, we also um, are facing declining enrollment, which led this year, uh, excuse me, for next year to one less homeroom classroom. Um, with a half day reduction, we will not see any decreased opportunities for students in music. So students will continue to have all homeroom classes will have general music, chorus, and band and instrumental lessons. Um, the schedule will be a little bit tighter, but it is all it is seemingly manageable. Uh, we have a schedule that, that's drafted that allows for our, our programs to continue. Thank you. So I'm Gillian Fuqua. I'm the principal over at Doty Memorial in Worcester. Um, Doty is experiencing no changes in the art or music, FTE or programming. But one thing that I wanted to bring up is that we're really hopeful of doing is it's extremely challenging to figure out how to fit it all into a day and make it all work. And we would like to pick up from January 2020 when um, there was the board meeting where we talked about strings and would um, like to use this as an opportunity to partner with the music department K-12 looking at how can we provide um, parity in our offerings across schools and how can we provide that all schools have equal access to instruments and um, other resources that they might need and develop a vibrant and strong K to eight music experience for our students. Hi, I'm Alicia Lightford, the principal at East Montpelier School, and my colleagues all said everything beautifully, and I really don't have much of anything to add, except that we also have no um, reductions next year in art or music. Um, and I can also speak similarly to Erin. We have very similar sized schools with the same number of classrooms, um, and we're able to provide a similar experience for our students with band and chorus. Um, instrumental lessons and general music. Um, and I, I too hope that 
from this, I, I want to say very painful and unfortunate experience that I don't think any of us want to live through again. And my hope is that we all have some lessons that we can take and learn from this and do better next time. Um, but my hope is that we can work in collaboration with the music teachers. I know they have amazing ideas. We know that they're the experts at the table. And if changes to music programming needs to be made, then they need to be the ones to do that with us. And our hope is that that can happen soon. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions from members? Chris McBay? You're muted, Chris, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, thank you, uh, each of you, each of the, the um, principals for uh, your comments. Um, I, I am still a little mystified, however, uh, that um, the same access to art and music can occur uh, when in, in Berlin, uh, the music is being reduced by 0.3 um, FTE uh, and the art is being reduced by 0.2 FTE. Um, uh, the same, same comments for um, the callus where there's a reduction in the music from point four to point three, so 1.1 FTE reduction. Uh, and then the arts are reduced also by a 0.1 FTE. Um, and then the same comment for the music at Romney with there's reduction uh, for 0.1 FTE in the music program. Um, you know, it, it sounds to me like there is a, a struggle to create the same type of, of service. I don't think we were um, given the, um, the specifics about any potential cuts before uh, we voted on the budget. And I think cuts were, were known uh, at that time. It also sounds like there was no collaboration with the music staff or the art staff uh, before these cuts were considered. At least that is my takeaway from prior, uh, prior board meetings um, and discussions with the staff. Um, I am, I, to be quite blunt, I am hopeful that we uh, vote to restore these cuts um, uh, and that will maybe provide um, the opportunity for the music uh, staff to collaborate with, with the administration and develop uh, the type of K through 12 music program that we heard uh, Gillian talk so eloquently about. Thank you. Diane. So I just have a couple of questions and, and um, one is, I'm just stumped as to where this is in the budget. So, you know, I did notice that one of the last lines on the letter from the leadership team, and please don't view this as disrespectful at all. I really appreciate each of what each one of you were sharing, but the statement at the bottom of that letter says that the staffing that you're in support of the staffing remaining um, as it's budgeted for in the 21-22 budget, we were, I, I was not cognizant of any kind of cuts to the arts. And so I guess I'm asking, where is that cut present? Where, you know, there's a number of things listed. Uh, I completely hear you, Brian. It was a very scary time in November and December. And um, then those major cuts were recommended and so I wasn't as concerned. And then we also knew as the change in context. So I, I worry that's one of the transparency issues I have is I could, did not see that at all in the budget. So please help me see where that's at. Because otherwise, to me, that statement in that letter says that it does stay at minimal status quo if we didn't have those cuts noted. Then the other part of that was um, that you know, we are in a different world now. And, uh, you know, again, I apologize for not even thinking about that March 29th when we explored it. But I wonder if the lens of what does learning forward and the re-entry, the reintegration, re-energizing of our kids is as we come back from COVID, did we apply that lens at all to when we look at what music and art might mean for kids as they come back in and it, do these ESSER grants give us that availability of figuring it out? 
again, I don't mean any disrespect to the thought that's been put into it and the ideas that have been shared. These are just the questions that are popping up for me. Uh, Lindy and then Stephen. Um, I, Diane just said it very well. We were not, we were not told that there were program cuts. In fact, we were told there would not be program cuts, that they would be administrative cuts, which I, at the time, questioned, what does that mean? Um, and the other thing that really bothers me is when we've done this in the past and had public forums specific about program cuts, the people in those positions had an opportunity to apply for other jobs when the job market was open, waiting until April 1st. If I'm the person who's now being told I'm being split between two schools, and that is not easy for me with a family or whatever my situation is, maybe I share a car with somebody, you have not given me the opportunity to look elsewhere and do what's best for me when you do this April 1st. That to me has been one of my biggest issues. If this is what's necessary, our numbers haven't dropped precipitously in six months, except maybe COVID and remote. But I think there needs to be a more thought out time frame with public input from the teachers, from the staff. You're, I also am wondering if you're going to burn out people if you say, okay, we're going to cram you into this much time because we have one less class. And we know in our small schools, it's not easy when three kids move away and they're all in different classes or, and we have to reconfigure. So when we have small schools, we have to be a little, um, we, we just have to realize that. And one of the private schools in our district area is getting very big. And I think people are going there because of their arts programs and the things they're offering. So we have to think about that. But I'm more concerned about how we're treating employees and people on our staff being told when they get their contract, oh, by the way, you're now in two schools or what, you're, you're cut, whatever. So that's my concern. Thank you, Lindy. I lost track of who went first, Stephen or Scott. I'm gonna go with Scott and then Stephen. Am I missing somebody? Scott's, Scott's pointing at me. Oh, um, okay. Well, I always like to listen to, okay, go. Um, so I, I, I would just like to offer a different perspective. None of this was a surprise to me. I heard this and understood this in December. Um, I, I don't think we knew specifically what um, buildings were going to be impacted, but we knew what these cuts were. We discussed it. Part of the discussion was the board preferred to know specifics on where they were going to be, and that information wasn't available. But the number of FTEs and where they were going to be cut was discussed as the board. The board voted on that issue and voted to support it. Thank you, Stephen. Scott, and then Jonas. Thanks, Flora. Um, although this may come as a surprise to some of my colleagues on the board, I really do try to learn from my mistakes, um, which means I do a lot of learning. And one of these mistakes um, came about a year and a half ago um, when the board I think with the absolute best of intentions, voted to uh, earmark essentially $50,000 to um, expand the strings program in the schools. Um, that, that not only flopped, it, it blew up um, and left a crater um, because as well-intentioned as we were, we forgot that we're not a board for a single school anymore. We're a board for multiple schools. And it's a complex organization. Things like expanding programs 
can't happen without a lot of consultation, a lot of working among the various uh, parties involved. And I, I think, you know, for us, um, all of us want as much music and art, um, as much joy in our schools as we can possibly uh, have. But it has to be worked through the system. And the system is a lot more complicated than it used to be. So with that, I'm supporting the, uh, the leadership team um, on keeping the budget as it is and um, looking as I think Alicia may have referred to before, you know, what can we learn this time? Um, and how can we actually get to a better place in the future? but recognizing that it's not something the board can wave a magic wand and change, but that it takes time, it takes hard work, and it takes focus, um, sustained focus. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Jonas, Dorothy, you're on deck. Uh, so I was, I was not gonna speak uh, because I have some pretty strong feelings about the the process here, the way this was uh, communicated to us, uh, but uh, with all, I, I respect Stephen look maybe more than any other single person in this room, but I have to push back Stephen. We did not discuss the riff. I see you, Scott. I respect you a lot too, but Stephen's, Stephen's at the top of the pyramid as far as I'm concerned. We, I, we did not talk about this. We praised the superintendent and the administration for deep cuts in the budget without riffs we explicitly were happy that the budget had happened without the rifts. And as I pointed out in the last me uh, meeting, the board, a number of people on the board specifically requested, if there is a downside to this budget, we need to know it. And we were never told. Um, in, in, in fact, the board didn't, the board was not aware that any rifts were occurring until the second draft of the agenda for that special meeting, which was sent out on Friday morning, and the special meeting was on Monday. The decision was known in December. The board had less than 72 hours to learn about this, very little time to ask questions. I feel sandbagged. I feel a little bit gaslit. Um, I feel deceived and not trusted to make appropriate decisions. I feel like an information was kept from me to protect the, the, the passage of the budget um, because it was known that this would be a controversial topic and it was kept under wraps until the very last minute. Um, to be frank, the letter that's included in this week's board packet signed by all the principals is extremely convincing. And what all the principals have said here today is extremely convincing. Um, I, I am 100% confident that this board and everybody who works in this district is committed to music and the arts. Absolutely. We're not going to balance the budget on the back, you know, uh, at the expense of music and the arts. We're not going to, you know, engage in some, you know, perverse uh, definition of equity and remove services so that everyone meets the lowest common denominator. That's simply not what we're going to do. Um, but I also feel like the process here has alienated many, many, many people. Um, I am one of them. Um, and so even, even though I find the, the, the argument entirely convincing, um, this time compared to the, the previous letter which was written, um, um, I am, I'm going to vote to restore uh, the cuts uh, simply as, as a protest in the way that I feel like this board um, was misled. Thank you, Jonas. Dorothy? Oh, yeah, um, I agree with Stephen. Um, I see the past uh, meetings in December and going forward. I understood what was going on and I understood that there were not any major rifts, but I also understood there may have been, there may be some reshuffling. And what I find tonight, or I found very rewarding, and I was not aware of it, is 
how close the elementary school principals have come together and they have agreed to this and they did agree to it way back at the beginning, apparently, quite early on. They did not have to be, have their elbows twisted or whatever. They saw the handwriting on the wall. And I also remember the meeting at Berlin when the board wanted to give $50,000 to a string program and some principals or I'm not sure who they were spoke up and said, yeah, we want to do this, but you got to give us a chance to figure out the scheduling, to figure out how it's going to fit. Even if you give us all the violins in the world, we have to fit it into the day that is now demanding more time for literacy and math, which we all know really our district is not doing that well in. So they certainly are not going to cut back that time. The principals aren't if they have a chance. So I really understand the scheduling thing. And I really understand now how the leadership team works. And I'm kind of like Alicia. We, there have been mistakes made. Let's not beat a dead horse. We, those of us who have made the mistakes have said, yeah, we made a mistake. Let's move on. Let's do it right from now on. Um, I can see where uh, Brian had some information. He tried to figure out what was the appropriate time. He, we didn't have any, apparently had any policy or anything in our negotiation agreements that gave him an idea of what to do. So he followed what he had as best he could as far as timing. Um, I, I just feel that we shouldn't, we shouldn't make the change uh, to change what the leadership team and our administrator has decided is the best route for us to travel. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, Jonas, is that a new hand? Not again. Okay. Uh, Lori and Gillian, and then we have a really long agenda today, so I don't wanna keep going. So I'm just gonna de dedicate a few more minutes to this. I know that this is really important, but I would like every board member to be able to have a, a chance to ask questions if they have them. Go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, I just wanted to let you know that there was a budget line that said staffing changes, which included unfilled early retirement positions. And the total amount shown to the voters was an, a reduction of $390,518. Um, it wasn't intentional that it didn't say RIF because at the time, and I said this at the last meeting, we had had 42 temporary contracts issued this year. And we believed at the time that people wouldn't be rift, that the uh, reduction would be done by not uh, renewing a temporary contract. And we did do um, that reduction in the budget. I just wanted to go to bat. The principals have been working on this. I did some homework since December of 2018. Um, they have had a lot of time to think about this. this their recommendation has been in several meetings. So I wanted to go to bat for that and to also let you know that it was only on March 18th that we learned that there were temporary contracts and they were not in art and music. So it would result in a RIF. After that date, we met with um, the principals again and we had a plan of discussing this and confirming and it was unanimous that all the principals supported this together. So I just wanna say this was not an intentional slight of information or intentional um, act by any one party. And the superintendent wasn't even here when this conversation started. So I feel like somebody needs to say that. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Gillian? Um, I just wanted to take a second and really quickly answer Chris's question about the um, the time question that he had, and where 
where the time came out of was non-student contact. Does that make sense, Chris? Oh, you're muted. When you say non-student contact, but within the music or art programs. So what, I, what we looked at was within the teacher's schedule over the course of the week, what percentage of time had was student contact and what percentage of time they were had either planning time or time with no student contact. Okay, so, so the, the, sorry. No, fine. So the reductions come out of the teacher's planning time or other non-student contact time. Can you explain what that would be? If it's not planning time, it's what? In terms of a non-student contact time. So this is where some of my peers can jump in and help me out, but there is unassigned time um, within the day. And so what we looked at was creating parity across all, all teaching positions. So we, you know, we had the, there's the guaranteed planning time, the duty-free lunch, and then the percentage of time that is spent in front of students and not in front of students. And so for the, um, for the music positions, there was no, none of the minutes, no minutes were taken away from student time. We'll just add to that, Gillian, just for clarity. If you look at a teacher's, all teachers' contracts, whether regardless of their FTE, will say in general, the for elementary, their start time is at 8.15 in the morning and their end time is at 3.45 at the end of the day. By contracts, they get 30 minutes for planning. Most of us provide more than that. Um, they get um, 30 minutes duty free lunch every single day and they have a, a number of duties per week based on their FTE status. In addition to that, they're always with um, students, be it morning meeting, be it greeting at the door, be it literacy or math or music. When we did a, a time study for some of these positions, we noted that when you take out planning time, duty-free lunch, um, student uh, classes or instrument or band or art that there remained a significant amount of non-student contact time that showed there was a lack of parity across all of our teaching staff. Parity in what way? I, I'm hesitant to, yeah. um, to go into too much detail because I, I don't wanna call out individual people, um, Chris, but I do think it's important that we're transparent and not engaging in a dance with words. Some teachers have more um, time that is not working with students than others. Okay. And that is where we have made the cuts. Can I just add a tiny bit to that um, piece, Kat? Um, so there are teachers um, in our elementary schools, when we looked at this and did this time study that had more time than others. And I would say that even with these cuts, those same teachers um, we may still have more time than others. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't actually leveling the amount of um, prep time so that every teacher in every building gets their 30 minutes. There's still, a lot of discrepancy in that among our buildings and within our buildings. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alicia and Kat and Gillian for clarification. It, last uh, opportunity for board members that haven't spoken. Otherwise, uh, I, I believe we ask our leadership team to come back with us. And this is a follow up and they came back with their recommendation. So um. I'm assuming that we could do a straw poll like we did the last time, since we already voted in this uh, before. Uh, but sure. what would the pressure of the board be? Um, Floor, I'm gonna make a motion that we restore the cuts uh, that were made to the arts and music programs across the district. I'm gonna second that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. <coughs> Any discussion? 
Um, uh, just briefly, um, you know, I think in our, our district, we've prided ourselves on collabor collaboration uh, amongst all the interest groups, um, in including staff members, community, administration, and board. Um, I think it is uh, painfully clear that that type of collaboration did not occur um, in a very difficult situation like this where we're cutting um, art or music or any other position. Uh, and it does not build trust. I mean, we heard earlier today that uh, trust is the keystone to an effectively functioning um, organization. Um, so because we did not have that, I think we should just restore and, and then renew uh, any type of uh, move in this direction next year with all participants having the opportunity to talk before the hammer falls. Thank you. So because this issue is a little controversial, I'm gonna do something different that we have done before and I'm gonna do a roll call. I do wanna say that voting yes, as is my personal opinion, and just to clarify the motion, voting yes in this motion does, doesn't, doesn't undo the communication. It doesn't make the communication better automatically. This is a strict vote on the recommendation. Do we approve or not the recommendation of the, of the leadership team. So if you're moving to restore, hold on a minute. If we're moving to restore the, the, the position, it means that we do not accept the recommendation of our leadership team. If we vote to uh, no, it means that we accept the recommendation of our leadership team, just for clarification. Um, Floor, can I ask you just to clarify that again? Because if we're my motion would require a yes to restore and a no not to restore. I, I understand that, but I want to make two, I want to make it clear that there were two separate issues here. One was right. the transparency and the communication and the way that we share this information, the way the information was shared with us. That is completely separate to the planning and the educational outcomes that the, the principals are sharing with us. So I don't want to confuse those two. So if you're voting yes to restore, you're voting no in the recommendation from the leadership team. And if you're voting no, you're voting yes in the recommendation of the leadership team. Is that clear? That is clear. And I would call the question. I would call the question. And uh, well, I don't or, know that I can I'm call sorry. the question. It's still yeah. not clear for me. Can you? Stephen, you are uh, way better than me. Saying so, that if we're, if we're going back, what might be viewed as backwards. So if we're view, if we're yes. saying yes to Chris's motion that we want to restore the positions, in essence, what we're saying is that we're not um, we're not taking the recommendations of the leadership team. So Correct. we vote yes. We're restoring the positions. And that has a subtext of not accepting the recommendation. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to do a, a roll call so that we can uh, make it very easier. So Scott? No. Diane? Yes. Chris? Yes. Is Stephen look? No. Sorry, I'm having trouble seeing it. everybody in from in Lindy. And first, if there's somebody not muted, could they mute? Everybody mute themselves, please. Thank you. Lindy? Yes. And who am I missing? Dorothy? I can't hear you, Dorothy. Is that me or you're muted? No. Okay, hopefully somebody else is helping me come to. Uh, Jonathan. Yes. Okay. Uh, what am I missing? Jill? You're not on no. my screen, but Jill? 
No. Thank you, Kari. No. And then I don't see anybody else but myself. Is that right? Am I just? No, nope, you missed I, me. Oh, sorry, Jonas, Jonas, Jonas. Uh, yes. So I guess if that's everybody and myself, I vote no. So I count eight no's. Is that correct? Uh, Lisa, do you mind confirming with me? Sorry. Um, I think I, it was six and five. I, yeah, it? I have six okay. no's, one, two, three, four, five, six no's, and one, two, three, four, five yeses. Okay. Sorry, I'm just taking two quick notes here. So that the, the no's have it, so the motion fails. Thank you, everybody. So 4.23, uh, Brian, Equity Scholar. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, this is a, uh, the, what you have here is the MOU for the Equity Scholar in Residence program that you approved uh, a few board meetings ago. This is an opportunity to take the good work of our Equity Scholar in Residence, uh, Shelly Vermilia over at U32 and expand her opportunity to work with our staff across the entire district uh, around uh, building our capacity around equity. Uh, and, and so what we've done is we've worked on, uh, I've worked with the Washington Central Friends of Education, uh, Lucinda Garthwaite, and uh, was able to come up with a new MOU that is based on a district MOU, district-wide MOU, rather than a U32 MOU moving forward. And so all I'm, uh, the recommendation I have for this is to uh, ask the board to uh, authorize me to sign this MOU. Scott, you have a question? I, I was just gonna move that we authorize the principal to sign the MOU. Yes. Superintendent. So, superintendent, oh, can you make Superintendent, that apologies. So motion by Scott and second by? A second. Thank you, Chris. Any more, any discussion or questions? Yes, I, I have some questions because this is essentially a contract. So I have some questions yeah. about this contract that we'll be signing. Um, the uh, number four on page six, um, it indicates to me that the um, ES, the person employed will not be subject to uh, the authority of this, whatever school principal they're in because they're not subject to uh, district employment policies. Um, why is that? Uh, yeah, so I, I can uh, also have, I don't know if Stephen is here, he can, might be able to chime in, uh, but I basically the, the way this model works, uh, there's a two different, what I've understand is there's two different ways of uh, some districts are around the state of Vermont and around the country are looking to have equity uh, and inclusion specialists uh, that work directly for the district. Uh, and as a result, when you have a person who works in that capacity to work with teachers to have conversations around equity and building, building our capacity and understanding around equity, uh, having those conversations with a district employee is very different than having it with someone who is a third party contractor. Um, right. So the idea... The idea is is uh, that it, they can have conversations with people that are do not necessarily um, um, are related to the district. It's a It's a it's really about trying to build the commitment to the process. This is what Shelly is uh, at U thirty two. She's always been a third party contractor. She's never been a direct employee of our district. Uh, I don't know if Stephen has anything else to add or or Jody because uh, this is so, the model. I believe I believe that we have policies that um, definitely apply to contractors uh, with the uh, with the to school district, um, and the policies include them within the school district. My concern is that this would take uh, this particular contractor out of that that compliance, um, and I, I actually don't see the reason for it. Um, and I, I I just believe that the the principal of the building and you, Brian, as the superintendent overall 
should still have some authority over this independent contractor. And, and this seems to take that away because I don't see it anywhere else. Maybe it's somewhere else in the MOU that I missed, but it seems to take that away. And I, I think that would be a bad precedent. Um, what I let, me, let, me, you know, let me go through all my comments first and then you can, okay. you can chime in. Mm -hmm. um, the next is um, on paragraph uh, five, uh, I'm sorry, paragraph six, that goes from page six to page seven, uh, number C, D, and E. Uh, my concern with that is that it uh, almost requires that um, the preliminary results of the study um, be the basis for moving forward into, the, into a future contract um, or relationship, as opposed to we, the district should be able to just say, we don't wanna have a future relationship for no reason or any reason. I think it's limiting our options. Uh, the next um, part that I have a question on is um, the what what happens if because we have in pay, uh, paragraph ten that either party can basically opt out uh, at a certain point in time if there's a violation um, if they feel the the agreement is violated there's really no mechanism for testing that as opposed to a party just saying we think the agreement's violated and we're going to opt out there's no provision there that says we get um, a proportional amount of our of what we're paying back on that. Uh, the other thing that that concerns me a little bit is um, on page eight where it talks about Washington Central Friends of Education, uh, indicating that it would provide the liability insurance employment employment functions and like workers' compensation coverage. It seems to me for the independent contractor. Is that the way that that reads? Yes. Um, if it is then that kind of undermines that previous independent contractor designation um, because they're more of an employee of Washington Central Friends of Education. And second is that we should be, um, we should have proof of insurance by the Washington Central Friends of Education because ultimately if anything happens, the contractor will be coming back to our district uh, for some type of coverage. It's just a, um, a, a flow through. So those are my concerns about this um, this contract. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I can just uh, talk briefly. What I hear, I understand your concerns. Uh, what I can tell you is that this contract was uh, modeled after the contract that we've had for a number of years at U32 when U32 was a district. This was also shared with our legal counsel, who did uh, review this document. And the the premise of this entire agreement. And our relationship is based on having the uh, having Shelley work as a third party vendor, a third party contractor outside of not being an employee in our district. Uh, St Stephen, do you have anything else to add? I, I so Chris, a lot of legal stuff that I can't get into. I'll let you lawyers figure it out. Uh, but the the part. Go yeah. ahead. The, the part that we want to uh, stress with all of this is that we want someone who can speak about equity issues without the fear of evaluation from us. And so that's why we want the evaluation to be the third party um, for us. And so that's the part I would speak to is we want them to be independent from us so that they can speak to the equity issues without fear of a reprisal through the evaluation process. And that's where that piece comes from. Uh, as for all of those other things that you talked about, I'm, I'll let you guys figure that out. Okay. Because there's, okay. Chris, I just want to add, I just want to add that I was hoping that Stephen was going to use the same quote that he used the last time, but it's the only way to, to, to speak truth to power. And, and if you're really involved in a lot of the BIPOC work and in the equity work, that is super important. You cannot achieve that unless you are an independent person. Otherwise, you always get labeled as political is instead of actually doing the work that is needed. And Karen had her hand up before, and I don't know where she went, but she also was with Shelly, but I don't know where she went. I just, as a board member of Washington Central Friends of Ed, I just wanted to chime in and relay our excitement and gratitude about the this um, step that is on the floor right now to share the equity scholar in residence um, resource across the district. So it's been incredible at U32 and we're really excited about the step that's being considered right now. That's all I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Chris, any more? Um, no. 
No, I'm happy with the independence of the work, but I concern, you know, if something happens, yep. that's when independence can go away. Yep. So uh, I think what I can do uh, is work with uh, Washington Friends, but I will look at the insurance issue. We'll make sure that this uh, person is insured one way or the other. Well, Washington Friends, right. It, it sounds like Washington Friends is going to insure them. Okay, thanks. Brian, you're still on four point. Uh, yes, I, I was asking for the uh, uh, the motion to oh, sign sorry, the sorry. MOU. Could I have a motion? There's a motion. There's a motion, and it's seconded. Did I miss, is my internet being slow? Did I make the motion? Sorry. I, I, I made the motion floor right at the top. Yeah, okay, sorry. No, you're right, you're right, okay. Sorry. My internet is unstable and I can barely, okay, hold on a minute. So all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, the uh, next one was just the, uh, we had a, there's a, a grant that's been going around this, uh, the state. Uh, Kelly Bushy has worked with uh, Shelly and a number of folks in our district to put together a equitable education systems grant application. Uh, I don't, is Kelly there, here? I don't, I'm not sure. Is Kelly here? I would like to have heard this talk about it. If, uh... Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Yeah. So as many of you know, uh, Shelly is currently teaching a class um, with the, mostly a cohort from U32, but Kat, Bear, Jen, and I, and then Allie from Romney are in the class. Otherwise, it's U32 folks. But um, this grant was released or you know, sent out by the Agency of Education. And so this class decided that this was something that we were going to jump into. And three of us, so Meg Allison, Ellen Cook, and I, spent time drafting the grant and with first draft, and then we brought it to the whole class and they gave us feedback and we made some revisions. And so what we're asking the Agency of Education for is funding to help us establish an intersectional justice council in Washington Central. And so that, that council would be made up of students, parents, a board member, so get ready. If we get the grant, we're gonna be asking. Uh, leadership team, faculty and staff with an intentional focus to include stakeholders from historically excluded groups. And the overall purpose and tasks of that group are outlined in the grant. There's the three bullets here, right? So to develop, implement and monitor policies, practices and strategies that support culturally responsive and inclusive school communities, facilitate the development, implementation, and monitoring of culturally responsive and inclusive, inclusive curriculum, and develop strategies focused on diversifying our educator workforce to address educational equity gaps within our district. And so what we're asking, the funding is so that the one, we can pay stipends to the people that are on this committee because the expectation would be it'll be outside of the workday and um, for professional development, and so the hope would be that the committee would be up and running this summer and we would hire some outside expertise to come in and lead the work and to get the, the council um, some training. And, and we, put, there's, we could apply for up to $50,000. And so we put in there some resources for books and materials as well. Um, and so this is at this point, right? It's an application that went into the Agency of Education and we expect to hear back from them by Friday, actually. And you'll notice on the grant itself, my name is not on there, even though I did most of the work, but wanted to make sure that when the AOE communicates back that it was to Brian or Jen, because they'll be the ones to continue to lead that work forward. So. And, and I would just like to publicly not acknowledge uh, Kelly for her work on this. This is uh, something that she worked on uh, I'll, put many hours and put a lot of devotion into it. So uh, thank you, Kelly, for your leadership in this area. 
Thank you, Kelly. It's wonderful. Any questions from board members? I see just gratitude to yes. Brian. Yes, uh, moving along at the uh, last, me uh, last meeting, there was a, uh, a question about uh, access to facilities for all students over at uh, U32. Uh, Steve, uh, we, since that time, uh, we, we've asked, uh, I've asked uh, Stephen Delager Pate to uh, give us an update about the uh, facilities and how, how they're being used for all students. So I can turn that over to Stephen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks everyone. So the, um, you can see the details in the letter. I'm not gonna go through every detail, but I would just say that um, the foundation of the work that we're doing now is to have uh, several adults and students working together to make sure that the school is accessible for all students. And so it's not just transgender issues that we're gonna look at with that group, but it's all issues. So is the school um, both accessible um, physically, but is the school also accessible emotionally um, and socially um, for all of those things? And so we do have a group that are working on that. We'll keep reporting back to you um, when there are significant changes, but uh, the first changes are probably things around signage and, um, and just how we address some of those needs. But we also want to make sure that we, we say to everyone is that it all comes with an educational component. So as we make changes, we have to educate the community as to what those changes are and how they affect everyone. And so those two things will go hand in hand um, as we make those changes. Um, I foresee us coming back to you in the future with some, uh, some actual capital expenses around uh, adjusting some of the facilities, but for now, um, very small uh, adjustments through um, just the signage and, and some of the structures that we have that don't require a ton of money, if any. Any questions from board members? It's, it's wonderful, Stephen. Thank you so much. This is exciting work, and we will be ready when you need the money. <laughs> it, Brian? I want to also, money. yeah, I also just want to thank Stephen as well uh, for uh, the quick turnaround and working on this with his uh, administrative team on this one. So thank you, Stephen. Um, the strategic planning process. So over the last few weeks, uh, this is really more of an update. Uh, as you know, that we have a curriculum management review that's coming in. We're waiting the final report. Uh, we envision having some sort of presentation to the board uh, at, at a meeting uh, coming up in June, possibly looking at the Ed Quality Committee uh, meeting to do that. Uh, the, uh, but we still, are wait we still need to get the final report. Uh, that leads us into the strategic planning process. So uh, just to let everyone know where we're at is the, uh, we met, I was able to meet with the leadership team to gather their thoughts about the process. Uh, the leadership team envisions having a very collaborative process, a very transparent process, and an opportunity to involve multiple stakeholders across our communities uh, to uh, make sure folks are heard and give input into the plan. Uh, so we're, we're still, we still need the time, and it's, it's very busy at this time of year, uh, just finding the time for us to get together and uh, talk about this just on this one topic. So we're going to have to de definitely dedicate some time in the future around this leadership team. I uh, also uh, in attended the Vermont Superintendent Leadership Academy as a new superintendent. Uh, and the, we had our last meeting uh, just last week, and there was a session on strategic planning. And during this time, I learned, an I learned a lot about what's happening in Vermont around strategic planning, certain districts that have newly merged and tried to involve multiple stakeholders across the communities uh, to give folks uh, an opportunity to be heard and to uh, talk about the strategic planning. And the one uh, item that many of these newly merged districts did in Vermont that I learned was they first started developing a portrait of a high school graduate. And so the idea is, what does a high school graduate, what does that portrait look like at, 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 their, at the uh, flagship school of the district, the high school, and what kind of programming is required across the district to, uh, to get to that desired outcome? And so many districts around Vermont uh, that have uh, begun strategic planning or have done this in the past, began their strategic planning process with actually a process of creating and developing a portrait of a high school graduate. Um, and so these are just some things that we're exploring. Uh, 
uh, I will uh, you know, definitely like to continue to explore this and meet with the leadership team and then uh, prepare a report back to the full school board. Thank you, Brian. Chris, do you have a question? In the, in the um, process of, of the strategic planning, um, if there's going to be transparency and collabor collaboration amongst the different stakeholders, is the process through which the strategic planning process will be transparent and collaborative going to be committed to writing like it's a plan for how it's going to be transparent and how it's going to be collaborative and how outreach is going to be made amongst the various um, stakeholder groups going to be committed to writing and then, dis then distributed so people have something to look to and rely upon um, to be informed about how the process is going to proceed and how they're able to, to participate in it. Thank you. So Chris, I just want to make sure I understand. So uh, you're, the question you're asking or recommending is uh, that to uh, make sure to ensure transparency and collaboration across multiple stakeholders, make, ensure that the plan does include how that process will be for engaging stakeholders uh, and making sure folks are given an opportunity to provide input into the plan. And having that process in writing so that folks know what it looks like and, and can comment on it. Okay. Whether and, and, and also just, you know, just because one size doesn't fit all, so, so there's some ideas on how that can work best. I, I thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that definition of uh, transparency and collaboration around the plan. I appreciate that. Well, I didn't define either one, but I just said they should be defined oh. in writing somehow. Well, that's a start. Thank you. <laughs> so thank, thank you. Yes. Diane and then Carrie. I, I know that as part of the uh, agenda setting committee too, that we had talked about the fact that um, <laughs> options for the board to consider either, uh, you know, if there was going to be a potential exploration of an external facilitator or somebody in house, because we have such great uh, educational leadership within our buildings of our teachers or administration and that so that also having that as part of that consideration so that whatever's presented to the board that we also know what it is we're, we're looking at as well. Kari? Okay. And in the, the spirit of helpful suggestions, one thing I've seen that could work that sort of along these lines is um, consider forming a steering committee that would oversee the planning process that includes representatives from different stakeholder groups. Um, and that's a, just a suggestion. I don't see any other hands, but I, I agree with all that he's, he has been said. I did share with the, with Brian, I've been participating in uh, continuing learning for the past year on community engagement through the Great Schools Partnership. And I share with Brian some uh, resources from uh, Mark uh, Costin, who I believe has done some work at U32 too. Uh, about how they have done uh, strategic planning and mostly how they engage, make sure that everybody's at a table and figure out who's not at the table. So the equity lens through this uh, process is gonna be really important for our community. So that's all I would share. And um, I gave him the, the context for Christina Honer, who's the one that has been facilitating this continuing learning through the portrait of a graduate, which was similar to what Brian had mentioned to us too. And we had engaged on that as a board. I don't know if uh, Scott and other board members that participated with us when uh, we had our interim superintendent, we had started to do a portrait of a graduate with Montpelier. I know that is uh, you know, probably not at that time right now, but I just wanna put that out there too, that we have so many commonalities and we should be doing some more sharing between our two districts. It, so that should be part of the strategic plan. Okay, that's a mouthful. So before we get into equity, it's been, I was hoping to do it right at 7.30, but it's 7.40. I think we all deserve at least five minutes of stretching our legs. We've been sitting since five o'clock and two and a half hours is the limit usually for me at least. So if everybody be back at the table at 1946, okay? See you soon.
I'll wait for, see, I still don't see all our cameras on. We're back on air, everybody. There's Gary. So we're right at 4.3 and we're gonna start probably the most exciting part of our meetings as far as I'm concerned, educational quality. Well, so Carrie, I'll give it to you. Th thank you for that, For I was actually gonna make a suggestion. Uh, this is a little impromptu, but given the late hour and the long agenda, and this is something we discussed at, at, the, at Quality before that um, this is the kind of material that really deserves our full attention and, and brain capacity. I'm, I'm gonna see if the board, it would please the board to table this until we can schedule it for a time that um, we, can, we can give it uh, appropriate time and attention. I, I have no position. I wanna say what is the pleasure of the board? I don't see many faces, but the ones that I see it looks like thumbs up. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Sorry, Jan and Kari. I know it takes a lot of preparation to do this, but I apologize. But I think in yeah, lieu sorry, of the time. Sorry, Jen. I, mean, I think, I think we'll, we'd like to look to see what we can schedule, maybe a special session or something like that where it's front and center. And I believe we have two questions, Diane and then Stephen. So I know that one of the recommendations was that uh, there at the next ed quality committee we look at the um, curriculum review um, audit and and have that be explored and all uh, board members are encouraged to go to that meeting i wonder if the first 15 minutes or so kari could focus on how we were looking at long-range planning of of kind of future steps so maybe introducing that part of it too which would then help frame a future time that we explore this so just adding that as part of the start I like that suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Stephen? Uh, yeah, I would just e echo what Diane said. I've been able to attend uh, a, a fair amount of these. I was unable to attend this last one. And to be frank, I, I was unable to um, give the presentation in the packet the time it was due prior to the meeting. So I would, I would echo Diane encouraging people to participate um, in the ed quality meeting, but if you can't um, be less like me and hopefully more like others and, and spend some time uh, in the packet looking at the information that's provided because there is a great deal of information. Thank you, Stephen. And we're hoping that most people can make the June 2nd meeting. That would be the hope. <laughs> so we are gonna table uh, education quality which moves us right to finance. Okay, not so much of a break. <laughs> hi, Lori, hi, Brian, and hi, Finance Committee. Okay, let me, I just have my notes here at the same time, I was not quite ready. One second. The Finance Committee met yesterday morning at, eight, at 8.30. And I'm just gonna go in the order of the agenda. So the central office uh, ventilation bid, uh, I'm gonna ask for a motion. No. Uh, no. Floor, this is the one that the finance committee approved already. Okay. That's true, that's true. That was, sorry, sorry, that was right. Yeah, so we it just, uh, that one was in the packet, but we the finance committee has already approved it and it was just a follow up for you guys and see if you had any questions. You gave the authority to the finance committee to, to approve it and that is on motion. So let's move right to, uh, unless there's questions on that one. I don't see any. Uh, Authorize the superintendent to sign contracts in page 48. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Flora. I'll move to authorize the superintendent to sign all documents and contracts on behalf of the school district. Second. Chris, second. Any discussion? Oh, no, then I called the bus bar. Did somebody unmute it? Could they mute themselves, 
please. Thank you. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of the motion as read by Scott, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion. Now, Floor, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm like talking around and that. Yeah. Scott, could I have a motion and then I'll give some instructions too? <laughs> you want a motion for the blanket authorization? I I I, I believe what all we have to do is send an email and I let Laurie speak to to this. If okay. We're gonna so, everybody needs yes. to send an email just like we did last year. Right. And so I just was going to write it up for you to say this serves as my authorization for the blanket authorization for FY 21 22. Um, and this is if there isn't a board meeting, um, then we can issue checks and review it after the fact. Um, and we had found in person, you would circulate it and sign it. But tonight, because we're not in person, an email will suffice. Thank you, Lori. So are you going to send that language to us? Yes. Thank you. Any questions about that on page 48? So then we'll move right along into the annual bids. A renewed anticipation note on the end the investment bid. Lori says, share some information with us in the packet. Uh, so if we could have a motion, I we can have some discussion. I, I move that we approve the revenue anticipation note and investment bid from Community Bank NA. Second. This is looking like our finance committee. Uh, any discussion? We're floors herding cats. <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Cool. Hearing none, the motion carries. We, I, I'm sorry to be so, I, there's still somebody on mute it. It's just my sound here is not that great. If everybody could mute themselves, it would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So the audit service bid, We had a recommendation from the finance committee, Scott. Um, yep. Is there a second motion? Uh, have we voted? The... We, we, we voted. Uh, uh, but, but there's a second motion? Yes, yeah, to authorize the chair. You're absolutely right. right. The second okay. motion to... Um, well, in that case, I move that we authorize the board chair to sign the loan document for the board via electronic means. Can I have a second? Second. On, Thank you, Diane. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the motion as read, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is uh, carried. Okay, now for real into the audit service bid. Could I have a motion for the recommendation? Go ahead, Scott. I yield to my distinguished colleague on the finance committee to make that motion. Is that Carrie? <laughs> it's not he there anymore. It's, it's, he can't, he can't say no. He's still on. He just took a took a vacation. Okay. Um, I'll move that we off. Awarding the audit services bid to RHR Smith for a three year period FY22 to FY24 with the option to extend two additional years FY25 to 26. I'll, I'll second Kari. Thank you, Kari, and thank you, Chris. Any questions? Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor of the recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Moving right on into the property liability and workers' compensation in page 82. I, I can just share that uh, Lori explained that Dennis and Ricker and Brown is our current insurance agent and, uh, and the bid results. I just wanna make sure that other people know this because it's a lot of work uh, re resulting in 3,707 savings in, in the budget. Uh, so could I have a motion? <laughs> Move that we authorize the um, award the bid for our uh, liability workers' compensation uh, insurance and, and property insurance to um, Dennis Rickard and Brown for the total of, is it 206000 $206,871? Lori, you're muted. Sorry, um, $194,726. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll second. Thank you, Dorothy. Any questions, uh, Scott? Would Chris accept the friendly amendment to add and authorize the superintendent to sign? Yes, definitely. Yes. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. And then not last but not least, authorize the superintendent to approve the bids for fuel, oil, propane, wood chips, and wood pellets. I'll make the motion. Thank you. I'll second it. Lindy, second by Dorothy. Any questions? All those in favor of approving the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Infinite Campus Online System Update. I'm looking for a motion and then we can discuss. Otherwise I can also do a report, but it's easier if we have a motion. I can make okay. a motion to authorize the district payment for transaction fees for parent and staff payments using the infinite campus payment processor. Thank you, Lindy. I have a second. A second. Thank you, Scott. Any questions? Seeing none, as a matter of fact, seeing none, all of those in favor of approving the motion as read, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. And then uh, the Romney Per Educator position on page 85. Could I have a motion? And Casey is here if you guys have any questions. I move that we authorize the hiring of a power educator at the Romney School for the 2001-2022 school year. Second. Thank you, Chris. Second by Scott. Any That's questions? It. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Diane. Uh, do we need to uh, emphasize or put in the word for general education because the other, I think there's another one coming up that's special education and I didn't know if it mattered. Okay. Does it matter? Casey? Oh, I don't think about it. Casey? That, that might be a, a better question for Lori or yeah. Kelly, but um, it is not it is not tied to special ed funding. So that's I think that's the purpose behind that. So there would not be reimbursement for that position. Yeah. Lori? Have the same job description and the same, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, job title 
we entitle these positions paraeducators, whether whether they're regular ed or general ed uh, for flexibility. So I don't believe we need to clarify that. Thank you, Lori. Is that okay with you, Diane? Is that clear? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any, any other questions? Scott? Uh, I don't know if um, in the finance committee, Lori was kind enough to give us the budgetary impact mm -hmm. of each of these. Maybe the board is interested too. Sure. Um, I included the high side for a family plan and the cost would be estimated at $55,700. Hey, Lori, could you just do all three at the same time? So otherwise we'll okay. have you coming back each time. Okay. And the estimate for Callus is um, the same expense total, but because there's anticipated revenue, the net impact for Callus would be $24,508. And the impact at East Montpelier, it's a part-time position, um, but because the person um, that might be taking it would still be eligible for benefits, um, the amount I estimated was $11,971 for a total of $92,179 um, from fund balance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. Scott? Um, I... Uh... Didn't have a chance to ask this at the finance committee meeting yesterday, but I have not seen this this method of requesting um, new staff before, and I, I kind of like it. it. It seems to make sense, but um, is this is this new or is it? Um, I can speak to it. The new uh, policy says that if a position is not included in the budget, that the board needs to approve it. So these three positions were not included in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Lindy? Is there any chance some of this COVID money can be used? Lori? Um, I'm looking into the regular ed position, um, but for the special ed positions, um, obviously you would want to probably maximize your special ed first before you would use COVID. So um, we don't have all the instructions yet, Lindy, but I'm still looking forward to giving you an update in June. Any other questions in the Romney position? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. I did hear you, Dorothy. For some reason, it comes a little later. Yours. I uh, sometimes I forget. Yeah. Laura, I'm, I apologize. I'm going to stay, and I missed the discussion. Okay. So, Kari will abstain. So, moving on. The Calus educator position. I'll I'll move to fund the Calus. Paraeducated position that's noted on page 89. A second. Dorothy, Scott, any questions? This is a one on one position, and it, it's, it's I, I don't know if you have any, I don't see any hands, but if Kat wanted to speak to it. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I have anything more to add than what I put in the, the note, um, other than I anticipate while I'm asking for this to be funded for next year, I anticipate it will be a need for the next few years. Thank you. All those in favor of approving the motion for a barricade for Callas, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Anyone abstaining? Seeing none, the motion carries. Now we're moving into the East Montpelier Pre-K Pedicator position. Could I have a motion? Uh, I'll move it. Um, move uh, an increase of 0.28 FTE for the Pre-K Paraeducator. 
at East Montpelier for our next Second. school year. Oh, sorry. Second. Thank you. Second by Diane. Any questions besides Alicia's memo? Anything that you would like to add, Alicia? Or we're good? Yeah. No, thank you. All those in favor? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none, the motion carries. And I believe that's all for the finance committee. So I'm gonna pass that on to the policy committee, Chris. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Floor. Um, so we are here to consider for first reading um, two policies, F44 on password management uh, and B8 on electronic communication between employees and students. Um, do we have any questions on um, F44 password management? Again, uh, uh, thank you to Jim Garrity for his uh, work in uh, helping prepare and then re revise these policies uh, based on the policy committee uh, discussions. I just want to say to Chris and to the rest of the team, Christina, Dorothy, and uh, Jody, and, and the rest of the group, I, I'm so impressed with this team. Certainly, working with other districts, I, I don't see anywhere near the level of engagement that I see in this district on the policy side. I've been very impressed with each of you, and I appreciate appreciate the hard work that you've put in. It's made my job incredibly easy and, and rewarding at the same time, so thank you. So hearing no, no discussion on F44. Yes, I have or... a question. Um, I have a question. Okay, uh, so the one is there, and I apologize, I didn't read it fully, but I kind of scanned through it. So basically users will change their password upon first usage. And there is there an ability for the district to reset or what happens if it gets lost or compromised if a student forgets? It's an excellent question, uh, Diane. So uh, on, on our side, um, the, the goal of the password policy is we're going to set the passwords long enough such that a user isn't going to have to change it every month or every two months. We're, we're trying to get the district to go to a yearly password change policy if the passwords are long enough. So if they meet that National Institute for Standards and Technology 16 characters or more, then we can change less often. Uh, now, if, if they forget their password or have some sort of issue, since we don't know anyone's password, so we can't we can't get in and break in as anybody, right? But what we can do is we can reset the password at any time for anyone. So if they get compromised, it's very easy for us to reset. And so in some cases, when they get compromised, we can offer up another factor of authentication, meaning that in addition to their password, we can turn on individually a 2FA, which allows them to send a code to you know another email address to us to their to their cell phone as a text message or they can use an authenticator to get in as a second form. Absolutely, thanks. Hi, Lindy, yes. Uh, it's, this is just a concern of mine with the policies recently. And it's just a concern, but I don't think we're the NSA. And I feel like we have had so many and we get these big, huge packets and reading every single word. And I'm just throwing out a caution that we are not becoming some sort of big brother and a teacher sends a personal email during school and is reprimanded and this is used against, I, I'm just, I'm concerned with how many policies I've been seeing that have not been in the realm of what we've done in the past. So it's just a concern of mine that I'm putting out there. Thank you, Lindy. Lindy, I'm gonna ask you to speak to the, Lindy, can you speak to that a, a little bit more thoroughly? And, and um, just because part of what I think we've been um, doing is trying to protect the system um, and also um, avoid potential liability for the district. Um, but if you think that there are areas that uh, go too far and create a trap for employees um, who unwittingly go into it, we would like to hear that because that's not 
that is completely not the intent. The intent is to protect the system uh, and the integrity of our system. And I understand that. I'm yeah. just, I felt like in the last few meetings, there have been a plethora of policies that are beyond my understanding technology wise or of what I've seen in places I've worked. And it could be just a little hesitancy on myself, my personal feeling of trust. And I was on the policy committee and they were always VSBA required or recommended was what we were looking at. And that's not what I've been seeing. So it's just a caution I'm throwing out there and I'm trying to read hundreds of pages of board packets, but I feel like, I'm just feeling like, I'm, I trust you, Chris, I really do. And I trust the committee, but I wanna put it out there that it's a concern. So one of the things that we um, had a discussion about was, you know, who gets to, if there's a, a, a question about a search, one of the issues came up with a search, uh, who gets to authorize that? Um, when, when the policy originally came, it was, I don't think it, would, it specified who in terms of the administration would be able to authorize that outside of a, an emergency um, basis um, in terms of either protecting this, this system from, from being hacked or going down um, or a uh, danger to staff member or student or community member along those lines. Um, and so we did build in the safeguards where it would be the superintendent or the superintendent's designee um, and not the IT folks being able to act unilaterally. So um, we tried to build in those safeguards so that a um, individual who would be accountable to the board, um, even though I think all employees are accountable to us, but more directly accountable, would be the one making the, the more serious decision about conducting a search uh, and issues like that. But, you know, I would, I would <coughs> be happy to suggest that we put some of these, um, the second reading over for a third reading before we adopt them, just to give everyone the time to, to go through them because they are lengthy policies. I agree with you completely about that. Uh, and they come at a time in our meeting where um, everyone is um, struggling to stay awake. Um, so, I, I mean, it's particularly for these because you know, the electronics are so crucial to our organization running and they expose so much of our personal data potentially um, that a third reading would be well <laughs> well advised in my opinion. Thank you. Chris, I, Chris, I agree with that. I think that the third reading is 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 welcome and, and will give the board the opportunity to, to to read through those. I think Lindy, back to your point about um, the lengthening of some of the policies. Um, there's some new policies that the, the SBA doesn't necessarily suggest. And so <laughs> one example that we, we've, did, we've done in a previous meeting was the, uh, the change management policy and how do we institute change within the district. So that policy originally started out relatively small and, and, and in concert with the team, we decided to blow that policy out so we could you know, create better definition around the things we were, we were trying to do, the things that, that were important. I think we talked about this change advisory board that you know, I think we developed a whole page of content there. So, um, you, you know, I, I, do, I do understand that there's, there's a lot there and, and we'll take as much time as you and the board need to, 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 to feel like you're comfortable. And, and, and by all means, you know, we welcome you, you, you know, you know ma making or suggesting any changes here and, and, and we're all yours. Thank you, Jim Scott. Thank you. Um, I know uh, Flora's dog starts barking whenever I say this, but um, this is another tendency that we deal with, with consolidation. Um, the greater professionalization and specialization of everything that we do. And um, it's not surprising, I think, that we, um, you know, it's bigger, there's more involved, the technology is advancing, and um, it's, it's just going to be this way. I have I have to argue this isn't consolidation because we've had our tech head over all six schools for years. They've worked together. So I, I am a little bit tired of hearing that everything's because of consolidation because I think we've worked very, very well as the five towns and six schools for years. 
Yeah, I think that this is a, um, just to piggyback on a couple of the comments, one of the things I found when I'm in here, now my job is to be critical. As a consultant, like my job is to come in and, and figure out areas that are at risk or things that we can improve upon. And so um, one of the things that I found um, that, you know, we can improve upon is documentation in the group. And so um, that was really uh, one of the purposes was to just get down on paper some of the things that we already do. And in addition, some of the things that we're not doing that, you know, back to Chris's point, will help protect, better protect our students and our teachers and, and the district as a whole. And so that's the approach we took. And, and, and again, from somebody who's just naturally a critical eye, I'm a contrarian by nature. It, it's, you know, those are some, you know, some of those things came out in the, in the policy. Jody and I had some good conversation and, and she was a, an absolutely awesome member of the team. And, and we were so thankful to have her. One of the things that she had asked for and, and we agreed with was um, after the policies go into production, we're not going or, or get approved. We're not going to put them into production until after we have a chance to, you know, train the administration, train the teachers, make sure everybody has a chance to ask questions, understand what the impact of, of these policies are. And, um, and especially around data, right? Because there's some things around what happens if you store personal data in the environment? What, what does that mean if there's a search called upon a, a device or something like that? What does that mean to you? Um, what's protected? What's backed up? What's not backed up? Those types of things. There's a lot of questions that come up. And so we try to be real thoughtful as to what happens there. So everybody is, is, is clear. But, um, you know, again, Joe, uh, Lady, I welcome, you know, any, any changes you'd like to make, I'm, I'm all ears. And I think the additional time, Chris, that you're suggesting, I think is a good one. Oh, yes, Scott. Dorothy. Yeah. Uh, Dorothy, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Been... I'm sorry, Dorothy. I, I... Um, I just wanted to point out that um, I, this has not so much to do with consolidation as the growth of technology and how we can be exposed to all kinds of things that Lindy, I was on the committee and when Jim talked about stuff, it was like Star Wars in a lot of a lot of ways. I mean, just the technology has really gotten beyond our normal people, or our ten years gotten beyond ten years ago, and we need to have these policies to make sure we're safe and all our teachers are safe and all our students are, and and all the information we need to keep safe. And I'm really glad that we went through this exercise, but it was a long one. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Scott. Thanks, Fleur. On policy D40 on page 98, the third line down um, talks about protecting the district's employees, partners, and the company. Um, is a company, should that be district or is, is there something I, else I, I, I use that, that word interchangeably. So I, I talk about the company and the district as one. I think there's a couple policies where we, we go through that. There was one specific entry that we did change, which was um, which was the word uh, business to district. And that was one that Jody found in our last in our last piece. What I'll do is just as, as a clarification point in our reading, Scott, is I'll go back through all the policies where we say you know, where we, we interface the business of the district or the company business of the district versus the, the educational piece of the district. And I'll smooth out any of the terms that, that are, that are you know, that are a mistake or that aren't clear. So, and, and in your, your piece on page 95, I'll go ahead and make sure we made a notation of that and I'll clean that up for our next reading. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Okay. I think it was on 98. 98, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yep. No problem. Yep. Um, any other comments? Because we will put this over for a third reading uh, at our next board meeting. Uh, feel free to send any uh, additional comments that you may have before the next um, policy committee meeting so that we can take them up if we need to on any of these policies. And we'll see you next go around. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank all the hard work. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Dorothy and Jody. Anybody and Christina. And Christina. Yeah. No longer. Uh, yeah. yeah, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, negotiations update, uh, Jonas. 
But can I just? You were on the floor. Can I just? Yes. Uh, so the second reading, are we doing? We we didn't do. We talked about the we policies for the first reading, right? So uh, now we're going to move. We didn't. No, we, we did. We did them. The second reading, we were the ones we were just discussing. Okay, gotcha. Right. Okay. okay, thanks. That's the third reading. Yes. Jonas, do you have anything that you want to report? Uh, sure, I'll say that uh, we continue to negotiate uh, with uh, both the teachers and the uh, ESP unions uh, regarding uh, what we hope will be a two year deal to take us to the next two uh, school years. Um, I remain optimistic uh, that uh, we are all negotiating in good faith um, and uh, I certainly hope and anticipate that we will come to a conclusion soon. Thank you, Jonas. Okay, let's move on into board operations and discussion. So the first part of this is the superintendent evaluation update. It's, so the committee, it, the, the board met today and we're gonna, our, our next evaluation is scheduled for June 23rd with Brian uh, from five to 6 p.m. So mark your calendars. And we are also, uh, we're continuing with our evaluation of our superintendent then. I think that's all we have to share. A any comments or anything that I'm forgetting from board members? No. Nope. Uh, just that, yes, that we agreed that we would finish out the process as it was and that we um, will use opportunities to review and revise and figure out what makes the most sense for all parties involved as we move forward to goal setting and next year's evaluation. Correct. Yeah. So we're not done. Yes. Thank you, Diane. Yeah. And the next one is the CALAS appointment update. So as of now, I have not received any letters. I have had two different phone calls <laughs> with different people. Uh, I checked in with Melissa today. She had not received any letters yet. Uh, I'm hoping that soon we, we're gonna have some candidates, uh, but I, that's all I have to report. I was hoping that we would be interviewing our next meeting, uh, but I don't know that. So hopefully before we have our agenda meeting, we, we, I would have more information to share with you. Uh, talking about this, the uh, uh, board appointments, Chrissy, uh, for the members of the public, the board received an email today. Uh, she's been hired at our district, so she is resigning from the board because she is gonna be an employee. So welcome to the family, Chrissy. So she's not here today and she has resigned uh, from, uh, from the board. Uh, and now in governance, uh, we had a, uh, Caroline was gonna, was gonna help us and she had, a, she was gonna put some documents together, but she is also, uh, has applied for a position. Uh, she doesn't know yet. So we are, uh, she's keeping today's step. I, there's somebody unmuted. Okay, there you are. <laughs> so Caroline will be, um, uh, hopefully will be at our next meeting. I received an, uh, a text uh, uh, from, uh, from, from her, but she hasn't made a, uh, she hasn't made a decision uh, yet, but as of today, um, she is not able to join us. So I don't have anything on, anything more on governance, but we continue to work in our continuous uh, improvement as a board and how we can best govern and, we will have a document for you at our next meeting. Now we can move into the consent agenda. <laughs> Could I have a motion, Scott? Thank you, Flora. I, I wonder if there's um, if there's an opening since we there there wasn't we kind of um, leaped over agenda revisions. If this would be a good time for me to mention S thirteen. Uh, I, I was gonna wait until before the signing, if that's okay. But you can you can go ahead and and and, and do it right now. So, Thank you ahead. very much. Um, I just wanted to let the board know because we joined uh, the coalition 
for um, student equity um, in Vermont that the bill that we have been supporting along with uh, the coalition of other school district boards throughout the state um, to reform the equalized pupil waiting system has um, passed both the House and the Senate now unanimously. So um, what that means is that there's a task force on the implementation of the pupil waiting factors report that will recommend to the General Assembly an action plan and the implementing legislation so that um, there is equitable access to educational opportunities for all Vermont public school students. So um, anyway, many, many thanks to, to our board as well as to all the other boards who have been participating in this and to Dorothy who has um, been another mainstay of this from on behalf of the board. So this is a, um, this is a, a good thing and well done to all. Um, can I jump in and say um, one of the things that's part of it has to do with I, I this has gone back and forth, so I may have this wrong. Uh, of getting rid of the um, the cap on your the penalty for having too high uh, taxes. So, yeah, I, I can clarify that, uh, Dorothy. So uh, one thing that was missing from what you, to add to what Scott was saying is that uh, the you know those the access to educational opportunities is takes into account the pupil weight factors that we deal with uh, right now. So it's not in isolation from from that, and the excess spending I believe is what Dorothy is trying uh, was trying to share with us. The excess penalty monitorium for the fiscal year of twenty. It's removed for 2022 and 2023. Yeah, and, that's what I was talking and, about. I don't know how that affects us, but it's good to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are not in the excess spending. And just to add to that, so the, the coalition work on this, the Vermont School Boards Association and the Vermont Principals Association and the Vermont Superintendents Association too, uh, along with a lot of parents in, and other districts is in our area. So yeah, it is a, it's a great thing. Uh, moving into the consent agenda. Could I have a motion for the minutes? Did everybody have time to review the minutes? A move that we approve the minutes of April 28 and May 10. Thank you, Scott. I have a second. second it. I'll second it. Thank you, Diane. Any discussion, any changes? Seeing none, all of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Can you abstain? Seeing none, the motion carries. And Lindy, I'm going to put this on you. I just uh, opened, oh, no, I'm I sorry, got it I'm open. Skipping, I'm, I'm, skipping uh, one. I'm skipping one, but yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I make a motion to accept the board warning or the board order in the total amount of $579,587.03. Thank you, Lindy. Could I have a second? And I know that I skipped one item, but I'll come back to that. Uh, I'll second. second. Second it. Thank you, Diane. Any questions? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Any opposed? It's like a little chorus. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries and the board orders are approved. Uh, going back to the instructional coach job description on page 129. Sorry, Brian, I skipped that one. Get to that page. So are we approving these? I thought I thought there I, was something where we had said we were just being informed of them. 
I think I, Diane, what, what, what I used to include these in the superintendent report, and then uh, I was at, I was asked to put it into the consent agenda so we can do these more quickly. So yes, you had asked us to approve them. Uh, so so yes is the answer to that, Diane. So we still need a motion. Sorry. I move we approve Diane. the job description for, uh, is it literacy coach? Sorry. No, these are instructional, instructional, instructional coach. Okay. Diane moves. Second. Scott seconds. Any questions? The job description was pretty clear. All of those in favor, please, all of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Pose. Hearing none, the motion carries. Yeah. Back to you, Lindy, or if somebody else has it in front to to personnel. Can I can I just say something? Uh, just interject here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, just personally uh, just thank Carla Messier. Uh, for her help with, it's been, uh, you see a lot of these, uh, Melissa Tuller and Michelle Sepka with uh, just helping to process this, uh, this amount, large amount of work that's been coming across our desk with uh, making sure we're getting teachers, new teachers assigned, uh, processing folks that are leaving our district and uh, setting up processes to interview uh, folks in our district. I just wanted to help thank them for not setting up the process, but actually scheduling it and doing, it's a lot of work here. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, their efforts this year. And as I was about to make the motion, I was about to say, whew, this is a big one. There's a lot here. Yeah. Um, so I'll do them by category, I guess, and then list each person in the category. Is that necessary or just a category? Okay. Um, I make a motion to accept the new teacher nominations, which include Annie Ledoux, at U32, Shannon McKinnon at East Montpelier, Christina Pollard at Doty, Blakely Gilmore at Callis, Callis, Andrea Dobson at Callis, Samantha Jackson at Callis, and Rebecca Hill at U32. Thank you, Lindy. Second. Chris seconds. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I know, sorry guys, everybody's falling asleep. Uh, so the motion carries. We don't have anybody in retirement. Uh, Lindy? Resignations? Resignations, yep. Okay. Um, to accept the following resignations, Marcy Larrabee at Callis. Uh, Megan Falby at U32, Haley Fitzgerald, U32, Ashley Gilstead, uh, Special Educator District, Nathan or Ted Nathanson, Special Educator at the district level, Erica Rose, Doty, Lisa Lavangi at Callis. Thank you, Lindy. Could I have a second? Second. I'm gonna give it to Dorothy since you've second some other ones, Chris. <laughs> I hear you, you said second, right, Dorothy? Yeah. Yes, second. Yes, that's what I thought. <laughs> all, right. all those in. All those in Wait, I have a question. I have a question, Flora. Right. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Just a clarification. So, why is Erica Rose considered a resignation and not a transfer, since she's moving into an art position for? Berlin and Callis. And and I think that would go for um, Kate Robb too, who's changing, but she's a new hire in the other one, so. Yeah, uh, that it's my understanding that uh, uh, the when someone resigns, they have to resign their position for, the transfer period has already happened. So we're just, this has occurred after the transfer period. Uh, and so what happens is when an opening, is, is a posted and someone applies for a position from another school, 
uh, after the transfer period has already happened, uh, they have to resign their current position in order to uh, take be considered for the new hire. Thank you, Brian. I assume this doesn't affect seniority. No, absolutely not. Thank you for clarifying that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries. Um, you have yeah, new hires now. Yep, yeah, new hires. Um, I make a motion to accept the following new hires. Seems like we already did that above, but okay. Um, <laughs> Katrina Robb, Berlin. This is um, Mark Klein, Director of Technology, Erica Rose, Callis. Thank you. Second. Second it. Thank you, Diane. Any questions? Lindy? This is the Katrina Robb one that after what Diane just asked, it appears Lisa had to resign, but Kat says it's a transfer. So I'm cons I, not Katrina, uh, Lisa, but the other one, the art teacher, Erica. Erica. So I don't understand that. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, but but Kate isn't up here under resignations. That's why I was confused. I can look into that. I don't know if Carl is still here. I can look up, but I can get back to you. Any other questions? This is just informational. Hey, Brian, when is the transfer period? It sounded like there was a specific period of time when yeah. staff could transfer within the, within the uh, school uh, district? <laughs> yes, uh, the transfer period, according to the CBA, collective bargaining agreement, is up to April 15th. After that, uh, if there's an opening in another building, uh, folks can apply internally from another, uh, another school in the district. Uh, and we typically do a five-day posting internally to, uh, because that's also part of uh, our practice here is to, uh, to, to give internal candidates an opportunity to apply for school in a, a job in, a, in the same school within the same district. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the transfer period is, uh, ends uh, April 15th, but yet there will still be hiring folks uh, uh, throughout, throughout you know, now and you know, hopefully we'll have a full staff but, uh, by, the, by summertime. But if not, uh, we have to follow the process of allowing anyone in the district the opportunity to apply. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, hearing none. Yeah, the motion carries. Brian, you have your hand up. Yeah, yes. I just want I just wanted to uh, thank Jim Garrity for his uh, help and leadership as our director of IT. Uh, uh, Mark will be starting. Uh, Mark Klein, I don't know if he's here or not. Uh, I know he said he was I here. I am here, Brian. He's here. Yep. I'll let Mark uh, talk briefly and then I'll continue. So Mark, please introduce yourself and say hello. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Klein, as uh, you mentioned, and uh, I'm very excited uh, for this uh, director of technology position. I was actually in uh, your area today, uh, uh, signed a contract uh, or at least an offer for a house and uh, found a storage unit, which are incredibly uh, in incredibly short supply. So. Uh, it was a good day from that standpoint. Um, I think that uh, Vermont is such an exciting place. Uh, it's so innovative. And I uh, really look forward to, uh, to being able to work with you. If anyone has any questions or something, I'm happy to respond. Uh, otherwise, I'd just like to say hello. Thank you, Mark. Welcome. I think, any questions I think the from cat wants to say something. I thought I heard a cat meow. Maybe they want to talk to Mark. I saw the cat poke his head in a couple of times on Lindy's <laughs> screen. My cat is trying to figure out the cat that's coming through the speaker. <laughs> I know it's my it's my cat that is trying to get out. Sorry. <laughs> so 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 I just wanted to thank welcome Mark and uh, thank Jim Garrity for his help and leadership. Uh, Mark will start July first. 
we'll then start developing some crossover uh, between Jim and, and Mark, and then uh, we'll uh, thank Jim uh, officially for his service. Thank you, Brian. Thank, thank you, you, Mark. And Jim, we, we're not gonna say goodbye yet. So we're, we'll say goodbye when the time comes, I'm not ready. Okay, All right. welcome, Mark. Yeah. It, any future agenda items? I think we have a list big enough. So it, just a reminder that we change our, our board meeting to June 23rd. Uh, I just hope everybody received my email and uh, please answer to the, to the calendar invite so we can make sure that we would have quorum. Uh, Jonas? Yeah, I just wanna remind you and everyone else that we will need to get a special, you know, knock wood, we will need to get a special meeting together to approve the CBAs uh, when we when we have them uh, an agreement with the union. Thank you, Jonas. Thank you, Jonas. So uh, now we can come to board reflection. <laughs> and I know it's late enough. So I was hoping to get us out of here before nine. So we're almost there. Jonas. Um, so um, it's, it's been a, a, a long few weeks since our last meeting. Um, a lot has happened. Uh, there's been a lot of public uh, conversation uh, out there in the media and in social media and online. Um, the board has been, board has received, you know, dozens and dozens of emails from people uh, concerned about what's going on in the district. Um, and, you know, there are hundreds of people have raised concerns. Um, and I, I feel it incumbent to say it publicly that I am saddened and disappointed that there does not seem to be the will on the board to dig into those questions and concerns. Personally, I think that we owe it to the hundreds of grown-ups who work in the district and take care of the kids and help to raise them. We're all here for the kids, but there are hundreds of adults who work in this district. And I am very concerned that we are not going to hear their voices and we are not going to honor their concerns. Thank you, Jonas. Any other board reflections before Dorothy and Lindy? Well, um, even though you don't have anybody to replace me, I said I'd only stay till the end of May and I spent today um, finalizing where we're going to be staying in Bennington. We're moving to in Bennington in, in July. And um, I'll miss having these long meetings, sort of like a toothache, but um, I like being part of it all. And um, I'll miss stuff, but I remember when I left teaching, when we sold off our business, it seems to me as I look in my past, when I leave something, I seem to leave it and I don't keep going back and wishing I were there. Now, being part of this, I, I will miss being part of this board. And, and I really enjoyed what I did. And um, I think I had, had some good, good impacts. I hope that Callis will get itself together <clears throat> and find someone to carry on because I, I find it rather shameful that we have so many people who have spoken out and especially about this latest issue as Jonas said but they're not willing to put in and, and say, yeah, I'll try to help on, on the other, on the board end. And, and I'm really kind of, and, I, and that's true in some of the other towns. Somehow we need to find a way um, <clears throat> to get people to be part of the board. And then I don't know if Kat's still, Kat, I've got my shirt on, that the callous teachers 
gave me when I went to their. Um, uh, <laughs> You're a callous uh, cougar, baby. Woohoo! <laughs> so I, I, I got my my old cougar shirt on, the callous cougar, oh. and um, I've had a good time. And if you have a special meeting before June, I'll be there. But after that, no way. Enjoy what you do and, and do your best and keep on doing your best. Thanks. Thank you, Dorsey. Uh, Lindy and then Scott. I, I think it is worth um, one of my reflections is how uh, pleased I was that public comment was at the beginning, because I think that is very, very important. I've been fighting for it and it is part of open meeting law in my opinion. And I'd also like to recognize the many people who took time to write um, their opinions, their heartfelt reasoning behind whether they were in favor or not in favor of the arts and music cuts and changes. and. At first, I thought it was going to be more like the postcard that's already printed, but there were many, many um, very personal notes, and I did read them all. I think it's, I didn't respond to them, but I'm publicly saying right now that being on a board, it is our job to hear from the public, and I appreciate it, whether it's uh, positive or negative, or you need to know about this, and I've been on first East Montpelier and now this one for many, many years. And before um, this year, I had had one person reach out to me about a security issue. They were concerned about at an elementary school. And um, I think that was it as a board member. So this year has been a little different, uh, but I do appreciate being contacted. Thank you, Lindy. Scott? Thanks, Laura. Um, I just like myself to salute Dorothy um, for her uh, just amazing work for the town of Callis uh, and, and now for the people of all five towns. Um, I, I hope to become like you, Dorothy, when I grow up. Um, so um, our, our Callis uh, Select Word Chair has a motto that I think um, Dorothy may have sort of made uh, an allusion to. Um, the motto is, you complain, you serve. So um, it's fine to, you know, to, um, to write in and to make your opinions known, but I hope that um, at least some of those people who are, um, who are exercised about this issue will take the step of actually joining the board. Um, this is how we got Jill on the board, actually. Um, uh, you stepped up, Jill, and I, I hope more will follow your example. Um, and, and the final thing is just in connection with everything that's been happening, this has just been, um, a really, really hard year. And uh, again, uh, as I was saying at some point, I no longer remember when, um, everybody is everybody is really tapped out. So uh, I think it's, you know, as much as we can manage, we just have to try to make things work. There are There is so much talent here all around and so much, potential to really do tremendous things. Um, I'm hoping that we don't get sort of um, in our, uh, you know, cantankerous moods, that we don't get um, all hot and bothered too much about things and, and can get past it quickly so that we can just help each other do better. Um, because I think there's, there's so much that we that we'll be able to accomplish if we do that. Thanks. Any, anyone else? So I, 
I just want to say too that I appreciate it. Uh, the comments from everybody. I try to respond to every single email that came that came through, and hopefully, I didn't miss uh, anybody. The input is uh, the input is always appreciated. We always learn, and I think two things that I can reflect on is that we have heard you that uh, music and art, uh, as we said, uh, is important in our district. And as we continue into our strategic plan, we we have heard you. Uh, and the other, and the other part that I want to say is that I, I, I believe that we, you know, that that culture and climate matters, and just because we are in gardening season right now, we need to tend to the garden in order to have a good yield, right? So I just want to close with that, and uh, and we, we will continue to 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 monitor and evaluate. So we will continue to do our job as a, as a board. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. Could I have a motion to adjourn unless there's any other comments? I move we adjourn. I second. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Dorothy. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Have a good night. Bye bye. Thanks, Dorothy. <laughs>